Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey, and here let's do a deep dive on one of Unity's official multiplayer samples, the Galactic Kittens game. This is a very simple 2D co-op multiplayer game that works great as a learning project for understanding how to make multiplayer games using Unity's official multiplayer solution called Netcode for Game Objects. All of the source code is available so you can download it and pick it apart to understand exactly how it works. If you've seen my Netcode for Game Objects video, you should be able to easily understand how this project works. This project is intended to be as simple as possible, it is meant to be a bare-bones multiplayer sample. For something more complex, afterwards definitely go take a look at the much more advanced sample called Boss Room. That one builds upon this base and includes tons of optimizations that you definitely must learn to make a good multiplayer game. The reason why I researched this official project is because I'm currently working on my upcoming free multiplayer course. I'm hired at work on it and hopefully should be out within the next two weeks. So if you're looking for a guide path, stay tuned for that and go watch the free single player course to prepare for it. Also I asked Unity and they officially sponsored this video, so if you want to learn more about this simple project then check the link in the description to download it and inspect it for yourself. And if you want to make multiplayer games then Unity also has tons of useful tools in their Unity Gaming Services brand, so also check that out with the other link in the description. Ok, so first let's do a quick look and play through the game. And then let's open up the project and inspect how everything works, so we can learn how we can build multiplayer games. Now if you download the project to try it out, there is one very important thing with how the game is set up. Basically on all the scenes, there is one scene called Bootstrap. This scene starts up all of the necessary objects, so when testing it out for yourself, make sure you go onto this scene before ending play, otherwise you might see some errors. So here in this scene, let's hit play and try out the game. Alright, so here's the game, Galactic like Kittens, and right away we have a nice scene waiting for input to start, so I'm going to click with the mouse, and there you go. We've got a very basic main menu, so we can host, which is to create a host for the multiplayer, we can join, which is we can join as a client to connect to a host, or just quit the game. Okay, so let's go ahead and join as a host, and right away we go into a nice character select scene. So here, as you can see, this game supports up to four players, and each player can use a different type of spaceship. So by pressing A or D, as we can see the controls down here, by pressing that I can swap out which spaceship, which character I want to use. So let's select one, let's go with Cat. Okay, so here I've got another build, so on the main one I made it as a host, so on this one I can join, and if there you go, it joins, connects the brand new player, and sets a new character. So now again, on this one I can also modify my character, and yep, it synchronizes perfectly over there with the host, so I can change whatever character I want. So I can wait for some more players to join, or I can go ahead, press on ready, and there you go, now this character is set as ready, but the other one is still waiting. So the game has some logic waiting for all players to be ready, so as soon as I press ready on this one, there you go, it starts the timer, and both players load, and they both load into the control scene, and they both wait a bit so the players can see the controls, and once again, they both load, they both synchronize, and here it is, the main game scene. So I've got a bunch of controls, and now I'm playing solo, so I have to kind of control both at the same time, so as you can see, I can uh, play with a client down here, I can fire a bunch of bullets, or up here, I can also fire a bunch of bullets. Okay, so there you go, as you can see, a bunch of enemies are being spawned, all of them are being synchronized, so all of them are in the exact same position on both scenes. I can move around the players anywhere, and I can pick up some pickups, and with another key, I can enable a nice shield, and again, everything is nicely synchronized, so I can play around, okay, I'm probably going to lose one, but okay. Alright, so there you go, this player down there was hit, so the spaceship has been destroyed. Okay, now on this one let me try to make it until the boss fight. There you go, the boss is coming. Okay, so here is the boss. And I just have to shoot it, and the boss has various stages. And again, note how everything is still nice and synchronized. So the boss is doing a lot of things, and I just gotta take him out. And I end up losing, so we go into a nice defeat menu, where we've got a bunch of stats, so let's try again. So here I am on the second try, and here comes the boss again, so let's see if I can defeat it. Also, note how the characters, the spaceships, they have a different sprite when moving up or moving down. So those sprites are changing, and note how it is indeed being synchronized, so everything is working perfectly. Okay, so let's see if this time I can actually defeat the boss. And okay, just a bunch more shots. And just a little bit more. And there you go, the boss is exploding, and again, note how everything is nice and synchronized. And up here we go into a nice victory scene, where we can see the scores, enemies destroyed, and so on. Alright, great! So as you can see, it's a simple game, but this showcases lots of things that are very useful and very needed to learn in order to make multiplayer games. Okay, so that's the game. As you can see, it's pretty simple, which is excellent as a learning project. It involves lots of multiplayer topics, such as scene loading, character selection, spawning players, firing bullets, synchronizing the player, enemies, and boss handling the win and game over states, and so on. 
So now that we've seen how the game actually works, let's inspect to see how all of this is built. So for starters, over here looking at the project window, we can see all of the scenes involved in this game. Like I said, the first one is the bootstrap, so this one starts all of the necessary global objects. Then after that one, we go into the menu, so this is the main menu with the main buttons. Then when we create either a host or join as a client, we go into the character selection window. Over here, the players can join and select their character. Then once all of them go into ready, we go into the control scene. So this is just a basic window just showing the controls for the players to play. And after this one is on screen for a little bit, then transitions into the gameplay scene, and this is where the game actually happens. Then through the course of the game, either the player wins or loses, so either goes into the victory or the defeat scene. Okay, so that's the main way as to how this game is structured, so let's inspect the bootstrap scene. This one, like I said, creates all of the global objects needed for the game to work. We can see that it has primarily a network manager. This one is the main script that you need in order to be able to use netcode for game objects. Again, definitely go watch my netcode for game objects video if you haven't seen it yet. In there I cover all of the required components to make this work. So this one has the main network manager, and over here has all of the network prefabs. Also note one important thing, which is over here there is no player prefab. The reason for this is because the player prefab, this one is spawned automatically when someone joins. But since we're creating the network manager over here, and then when connecting, we are going to the character selection scene. When we go in there, we don't really want to spawn the spaceship right away. So that is why in this case we are not using the player prefab in order to automatically spawn any kind of prefab for the player. We're going to handle that manually as we join both the character selection scene and the gameplay scene. So there's no player prefab, then over here all of the various network prefabs. So this is basically the prefab list that needs to be added over here for anything you want to spawn dynamically in the game. So if you want the bonds to be able to spawn and synchronize, then they need to be here on this list. Then down here for the rest, all of it is mostly on default, so it's using the UNT transport, okay, great. And one very, very important thing is over here, scene management is enabled. So this is how you notice how when the host starts a new scene, the client automatically loads it. That is because this one is toggled, otherwise you'd need to handle that manually. Okay, so this one is the network manager, pretty basic, most of it with the defaults. Then we also have a loading manager. Visually, this one really just has a black screen, that's it. This one is only used for visually fading to black and fading away. We can inspect the script to see what it does. Here it is, and first of all, it extends something called a singleton persistent. This is a class that they made for this demo. Basically, it just creates a new singleton, so a standard static instance. And then just adds don't destroy and load to make sure this one is persistent so it never gets destroyed. That way, the unloading scene manager, there will only ever be one, and it will persist. So that is why you start from the bootstrap scene. Over there, it starts the unloading scene manager and then just lives until you quit the game. Then the other object in this scene is the go to menu. This one is a super simple script. Basically, just waits until the unloading scene manager has been created, and when that happens, it loads the main menu scene. However, note how over here it is not using the basic Unity scene management. Instead, it is going through this script, and if we inspect this, here we can see what it's doing. So it's starting a coroutine in order to do the fade and effect and so on. But then the very important thing is this one takes a parameter for is network session active. Basically, it's going to do two different types of loading depending on if a network connection has been established or not. Now over here in the bootstrap, over here we don't have a connection, so this one is set to false. So then over here, when this one runs, it's going to go with this one as false, so it's going to load the scene locally, and this one is going to load the scene as normal. So just go and use the Unity Scene Manager and just call load scene. But afterwards, when the connection is established, then instead of using this function, it's going to use this function. And this one over here, note how it does not use the regular scene manager, instead it goes through the network manager, accesses the scene manager on that network manager, and then loads that scene. This is important. Like I mentioned, this is why the network manager has scene management enabled. This way, only the host loads scenes, and then all of the clients, all of them will load the target scene automatically, because again, the network manager has scene management enabled. So basically for this bootstrap scene, it just sets up everything locally, so there's no connection at all here, just does the basic setup, and then loads the main menu. So let's open up the main menu scene, here it is. On this one, again, this scene also has nothing to do with any multiplayer, everything is still local here. It just has this menu controller with this menu manager script. And over here on this script, simply on update, just as for a key, and if so, triggers the transition. That transition then shows the regular buttons that we saw, the host, the join, and the quit. And down here we can see how that is implemented, so we've got our click buttons here. So for the host, when that happens, it goes into the network manager and starts the host right away. So again, exactly like I covered in the netcode for game objects video. Then it plays a sound effect and then calls load scene. 
But again, remember how the network scene, this one is now going to default to true. So when it starts the host, when it loads the scene, it's going to load the scene through the network manager. And also remember how this has the fade in by default. So first it's going to fade in, it's going to wait until the loading fade effect is finished. When that finishes, then it actually loads and then it fades out. So that's how the visuals and the logic are connected. That's how the host behavior works. And then when clicking join to join as a client, for this one, it's going to start this coroutine. So let's see what this one does. And this one is actually interesting. It's going to run this function, the fade all, which we can see what this one is doing. So it does another coroutine. And basically this one does the fade in, then waits for one second and then fades out. So this coroutine is pretty much just going to play that animation. So fade in, wait, fade out. And then back in the same join function, over here, it's going to wait until the load effect is on can load which means until it has been fully faded in. And when that happens, then it's going to go into the network manager to start the client. Again, remember how, because of that setting on the network manager to handle the scene management, because of that, when you change a scene on the server, the clients will automatically load that scene. So that is why over here locally, it is first fading and only when the fade has finished, then it starts the client, which in turn will load the scene right away. Okay, so after that, both of those will enter the character selection scene. And this scene is very interesting. Basically, I saw a bunch of people commenting on my Netcode for Game Objects video on how to do a multiplayer character select scene. So this sample is super useful. Here we see we have two very important scripts. So the character selection manager and the client connection manager. Note how both of these have a network object component. Again, this scene is now correctly connected. So the previous two scenes, they were only in single player, no connection. But when we get to this one, we do have a connection active. So in order to synchronize things, we need to make sure we use the network object. You must add this component whenever you want to synchronize anything across the network. So let's begin by inspecting over here the client connection manager. Now the purpose of this class is to handle the number of clients. For a game, you probably want to limit the number of players. You probably don't want an infinite number of them. But right now, if you just do start client, it will always join the network. So if you want to add some kind of limit to how many players can join, you need to handle that logic. And that one is handled over here on this script. If we scroll down, we can see there is a can connect function. So here it is. And the main thing it does is over here, just gets the players connected. So it goes into the network manager in order to grab the list of connected clients and checks if it is above the maximum. If so, then it says we are full. And if not, this one is allowed to enter. Now as to how this one is used, if you go over here onto the loading scene manager script, this script is listening to a callback over here on the network manager when the scene loads. So it goes into this function. And here, this one basically gets triggered when a scene is finished loading. And this one is triggered on a per client basis. So that is why over here, we've got the client ID. So this one is triggered when this client has finished loading. Then as usual for handling the player connections or non-connections, we want to run that logic only on the server. So if it is not the server, we return, we don't do anything. And then it's over here. So when the client finishes loading, that's when we're going to call this function, can connect client. And over here, this function is going to run that one that we just saw, if the client can connect. If so, then it's going to return true, so the client can connect. But if not, if for example, the game is already full, if so, then it's going to run this remove client function. And this function over here essentially kicks the client out. And the way it does that is using a client RPC. Again, make sure you watch my full video if you have no idea what is a RPC, client or server RPC. Basically, this one takes a client RPC params. And over here on the params, you can define what clients will receive this RPC. So you can send a client RPC to all of the clients or just a specific one. So on this one, in order to remove the client, it receives the client ID, then creates a new client RPC params and makes sure this message only goes to this client and basically tells this client to shut down. And then down here on that function really just triggers the shutdown, which means the client goes into the network manager and calls shutdown and goes back into the main menu. So this is both how you can click a player in any way. So you can use a client RPC on their end in order to shut down the network manager. And this is also how you can simply prevent more players from joining a phone game. Although I should point out that there is actually another method for handling this kind of logic. If you look over here on the network manager and we scroll down, there is something called connection approval. In the docs, you can see how this works. Basically, this lets you do pretty much the same thing. The one difference is this way, the player doesn't even fully connect like the game is doing right now. You can accept them or reject them directly during the handshake process. Okay, so that's the main logic for limiting how many maximum amount of players you can have. The other important logic on this scene is handling the character selection. So first, let's see how does the player actually join. 
Like we saw, that is over here on the loading scene manager, so it listens to this callback from the network manager, and then on this callback, it tests if the client can connect, if not, then it kicks it, but if it can connect, then it goes over here, and just calls this scene initialization function. This function then receives a client ID, and then simply spawns a new network object, and importantly, it also changes the ownership. So the server is going to spawn this prefab object, but it's going to immediately give ownership of that object to the client. Now we're going to see what this player prefab contains in a little bit. Then afterwards down here, the way the game handles all the players is basically on this array. So we can inspect this type. So here it is, it is an array of type player connection state. And this state is defined up here. Basically this is the type of data that you want to store for each player. So it has a connection state, which can be disconnected, connected, or ready. Then it has the player name, the player client, and a reference to the player object. So back into the init function here, basically just cycles through all that array, and then checks for the first slot that is pretty much empty, so the first one that is disconnected, and sets it as connected. It assigns this player name, this client ID, and this player object. Again, remember how all of this logic, this is only running on the server, not in any client. So only the server is setting this data. Then for sending the data to the clients, for that, the server uses a client RPC. So after the server sets its own state, then over here it's going to sync that state onto the clients, and it's going to use this client RPC. So it's going to tell the clients which one is the brand new client ID, which one is the state index, the player state, and the player object. Then the clients are going to receive this client RPC, and in doing so, they are going to update their own state. Then over here we see one other very, very important thing, which is look at the type used over here on the last parameter. This one is a network object reference. Basically up here, when the server is calling it, it is passing in a network object. This is essentially how you can send some references over the connection. Like I mentioned in the netcode for game objects video, in a client RPC you can only use value types, you cannot use reference types. So you could not make a client RPC and pass in the player object directly, but you can pass it in as a network object reference. So you do that, and then on the other side, on the clients, they receive that reference, and they can use the function try get in order to try to get the network object that relates to that reference. So it can get that player object, and then simply gets the component that you want, and assigns it like that. So this is how you can pass in references through client RPCs. Okay, so that's the logic for spawning the player. Now let's look at the player prefab. Here on the script, we can find the player selected character reference. Here is the prefab, so let's open it. And we can see this is a completely empty prefab, so there's no visual. It just has obviously a network object so that it can be synchronized, and then it has this nice script, so let's see. Okay, so here this script basically handles the character selection, and the way it does that is using a nice synchronized network variable. So as to how all of this logic flows, we can see it has a start, but remember that before the start, we are going to run the on enable. So basically, as soon as the player is spawned, when that happens, it is going to add some listeners to these events. So it is going to listen when the value changes on all of these network variables. So this one is going to run, hook onto these listeners. And then up here, then the start is going to run. And on the server, the server is going to set the player ID so that each instance of this prefab knows which player it belongs to. And in doing so, in modifying this player ID value, this is once again going to trigger this on value change event. So it is going to run this function. And this function is pretty much just going to update the UI. And again, remember how when the server modifies a network variable, all the changes are propagated to all the clients. So that's how this code is going to end up running on every single client. So the server sets that, and then when it does, it also sets the character selected. So this is the other network variable. And this one, once again, it is going to run the callback and update the UI. Okay, so that makes the default selection logic. Then as to how the player itself modifies their own character, the inputs are handled over here on the update. So we can see that it listens to the key A or D in order to select the character going left or right. That is going to trigger this function, so let's see. And this one, the first thing that it does is some basic validation just to make sure this value is within the valid ranges. And then basically uses a server RPC in order to tell the server the new selected character. So the client runs this logic and then tells the server, and the server then receives this and basically updates the network variable and in turn, the network variable, when that updates, that is then synchronized to all the clients, which then update all of their UI. So as you can see, the selection logic is super simple. Locally, the player changes something, then uses a server RPC in order to say what it changed to, and then the server updates the value, which then gets the update to all the clients. Also, there's one very important thing here, which is over here, right after sending the server RPC, 
Right after doing that, note how this client, this local client, automatically updates the UI. Basically, if you didn't do this, there would be a delay. The message would have to get to the server and then be propagated back into all the clients. So if you didn't do this right away, if you didn't update the UI locally, if so, then it would take at the very least something like 15 milliseconds, which is definitely noticeable and would make the game feel quite a bit unresponsive. So when making multiplayer games, this thing right here is one very, very important thing. Usually you want to tell the server what to do, but then locally you want to reflect those changes right away. You want to update the game state instead of waiting for a reply from the server. So this is a very, very crucial thing you need to know with regards to multiplayer games in general. In order to make them feel good, you have to update the UI right away, even if technically the server hasn't yet received that message. Okay, so this is really all there is to it with regards to the character selection. It really is that simple. The clients change their value, use the server IPC, and then that gets broadcasted to all the clients. One more thing in this update is we can see over here the escape. So this is basically a simple quit option. If so, then checks if this one is the host, so if there are no more players. If so, then starts a shutdown. And for the shutdown, once again, the same thing that we already saw previously. So it sends a client RPC to all the clients in order to shut down. And for shutting down, really just goes into Network Manager, shuts down, and then loads back the main menu. So that's it, super simple. Now the final important logic in this scene is the play ready setting. Again, here on the player character selection on the update, so we test for A and D in order to change the character, and then we also test for the spacebar, and it uses a server RPC in order to tell the server that this character is ready. So this is going to run this function only on the server. And then on this function, basically it tries to start the game timer. So here we can see what it does, basically it goes through all of the players, and if at least one of them is not yet ready, if so, then it stops and doesn't actually start the timer, but if all of them are ready, then it goes to enable a simple timer. We can see here the timer logic, again, just a basic flow timer, so it just counts down by time dot on the time. Note how this timer is only running on the server and nothing else. So it counts on the timer, and when that is done, it triggers this start game function. And this function over here triggers a client RPC in order to tell all the clients to fade in, because again, remember how the unloading happens automatically. So it tells all of the clients to fade in, and then the server automatically loads the next scene. So then the clients do the fade in, as soon as the fade in completes the scene, they receive the message to load the next scene, they load it and everything completes. Okay, so with that we arrive at the main gameplay scene, and over here we have another really interesting thing right away. So first follows the same pattern, so it starts over here from the unloading scene manager, so there's this callback, it checks if the client can connect, the server and so on, and over here it's going to run this initialization function. And over here, here is the very interesting thing that I mentioned, which is that if you were to spawn the client prefab right away, apparently you could get some desync issues in case some of the other clients took a bit too long to load. So the solution over here in this function is actually quite simple. Basically when the client connects, it adds the client to a connected list, and then it checks if this client is the last client, if not, then return and doesn't do anything. But if it is the last client, then that's when it actually spawns all of the prefabs. So if you use the automatic scene management, make sure you pay attention to this one potential sneak issue. So make sure everyone is connected already before you start spawning things. Then over here for spawning, it's pretty much the same thing that we saw. So it spawns a network object and again changes ownership to the client. So the clients own their own spaceships. For the prefab, that one is stored inside a scriptable object. We can see here under data, the scriptable objects containing all of the data for all of the various types. Inside each of them has a different prefab variant. So let's inspect this prefab. And this one, very simple, as usual, it has a network object. Then for controlling, this one is a co-op game, so the clients actually have authority, which means they move the transform directly and that is synchronized using the client network transform. So it's just like I showed in the netcode for game objects video. This client tells the server where it should be. And then down here we can see that these objects are also based on a rigid body. So it has a rigid body 2D component, and then down here a network rigid body 2D in order to make sure everything is synchronized. Although also note how the body type over here is set as kinematic, so that means there are no synchronized physics. So it has this and then down here the various player controller scripts. So let's see this movement script. Here it is, this one is pretty basic. If we go down here we can see how it actually works, so it handles the keyboard input. So just doing some basic key testing in order to calculate an input vector. Then with that input vector, it runs this function, so it takes the input vector and simply moves the transform directly. Then in turn, when the transform moves, that one is synchronized to the client network transform component. So very simple, exactly like I covered in the other video. But if you remember from the gameplay, the ships also change visual when moving up or down. So that part is actually synchronized over here on this function. 
So it just checks if the player is moving up or down and selects a sprite, and then once again use a server RPC in order to tell the server what sprite it should load. So then the server receives that message and simply broadcasts it to all the clients. Then the clients receive that message, and based on a simple enum, because again, you cannot transfer objects, so you cannot send a sprite through a client RPC, so over here it just defines an enum for all of the possible sprites, and then over here simply sets them on only clients. And that's really it for the movement, as you can see it's super simple. Then let's take a look at this ship controller script. This one handles various player logic, like for example using the shield. So you can see it tests for the input, and then uses a server RPC to tell the server to activate the shield. And in this case, the server is actually the one that is going to validate the inputs. So when the player presses, it is always going to trigger this server RPC. And then the server checks if this player can use it, so if it has enough specials. If so, then counts them down. And this one, as you can see, is a network variable, so it gets automatically synchronized. And then use a client RPC in order to tell all the clients to activate this shield. Then next thing this script does is testing for collisions with the power-ups. So that one is handled over here using a simple regular on-trigger enter 2D. So this one is only going to run on the server. So if the server detects a hit, if it detects a hit with a power-up special, if so, then validates if the player can handle more, and if so, once again, updates the network variable. It does that, and also importantly, down here, it actually destroys the object. So it runs this simple function, which calls despawn on the network object. And again, this logic only runs on the server. So that gets rid of the power-up. Next, for the health and damage, if we scroll up, we can see this script, once again, has a network variable for the health. And down here, it has a hit function. This one, once again, is only going to run on the server. And when this spaceship gets hit, it is going to count down the value by the damage, which in turn, this network variable is going to synchronize to all of the clients. Then it also uses a client RPC in order to tell the clients to play some kind of hit effect. And then down here on the server, it checks if the health is below zero, meaning if the spaceship has died. If so, then once again, just goes and spawns a VFX prefab and then despawns the actual player spaceship. Finally, it calls this function to say that this client has died. And then this function is going to run this client RPC, again, with the client ID as a parameter. And this one is essentially going to make sure that only this client is going to enable the death UI animation. So as you can see, all the health logic is also pretty basic. Now the next script over here is the one for the player shoot bullet. So this one actually spawns the bullets. And the way this script does that is once again using a nice server RPC. So when the player presses space, it triggers this function. It is going to get a new bullet, which once again is going to spawn a network object prefab. It does that, although note one important thing, which is over here, this one is spawned as a server object, meaning this one is not going to change ownership to the player that fired the bullet. All of the bullets are always owned by the server. So you can then inspect this prefab to see how the bullet works. So over here, we can find the bullet prefab reference. So let's open this. And on this one, once again, it has a network object, although this time it has a regular network transform as opposed to the client network transform. Again, that's because all of the bullets are going to be owned by the server. Then once again, it has a rigid body, a, rig a kinematic rigid body. It also has a simple collider and then a bunch of scripts. For movement, it has this basic generic movement script. Really just all it does is it's only going to run the logic on the server and just going to modify this transform. That's it. Then the other logic is over here, the bullet controller. This one has an enum for the bullet owner. So basically the bullets are always going to be the same object for both the player and the enemy bullets. And on start, use a client RPC in order to set the caller for this bullet. Again, different callers for player or enemy bullets. And then down here, some basic collection detection. It is going to test for hits with something that can be damaged. If it's a player, then it's going to increase some stats. It's going to deal damage to that object. And once again, going to despawn this network object. So all of it very basic. So back here on the gameplay scene, let's inspect the enemy spawner script. So here it is, the enemy spawner script. And over here on update, we've got the spawning logic. And again, this is only going to run on the server. Basically just has a handle enemy spawning function. And over here, pretty simple, just handles a flow timer. If it goes above a certain maximum, then gets a next random enemy prefab. It spawns a prefab and then the enemy handles itself automatically. Same thing for the meteor. So for the meteor over here, same thing, pretty much just spawns one. Then the important one is down here on the boss. So once again, that starts off as a simple timer. So when the timer ends, it starts this coroutine. And first, like we saw, it first plays a warning UI. So that is handled over here through a client RPC. So all the clients receive this message to enable the warning UI. Then just waits a little bit, tells the clients to stop showing the warning UI. And finally spawns the boss, again, just spawning a regular network object. Just spawns it and initializes the behavior. 
The boss has this script, this boss controller, which is actually a really nice state machine, but in terms of multiplayer logic, everything is really all the same. It goes through the various stages, firing various bullets and so on. And the final important thing is when the boss dies. So you can look over here on the scripts for the various boss states. So let's look at the boss death state. So when the boss dies, it is going to spawn some random explosions. Then it destroys the network object and goes into this boss defeat function. And again, as usual, this function does the same thing for any kind of loading that we've already seen. So it does a client RPC to tell the clients to load something and then loads, in this case, the victory scene. And finally, over here on the victory scene, we just see a bunch of basic stats. And that's it, that's the game and that's how it works. As you can see, it's a pretty simple, simple project, which works great for learning. It has all of the basics for making a multiplayer game. You have a character select scene, multiple characters, a maximum player count. You have moving spaceships, bullets, enemy spawning, collisions, a boss fight, and a bunch more. Here we saw how it all works under the hood by using lots of network objects, a bunch of server and client RPCs, some interesting scene loading, and a bunch more. And you probably also noticed some things like, for example, a slight delay on the collisions, the bullets firing movement, and so on. Unity themselves have said that this project is intended to be the most basic working demo possible. So all of those extra things, all those things like movement prediction and some more responsive visuals, those would be added on top of this starting base. For those more complex things, definitely go take a look at the more advanced sample called Boss Room. That one builds upon this and includes tons of optimizations that you definitely must learn to make a good multiplayer game. Again, remember you can inspect this entire project for yourself, download it with a link in the description. If you haven't yet seen my complete detailed tutorial on Netcode for Game Objects, then definitely go watch it now. And check out the other link to learn all about Unity Gaming Services. Unity has tons of tools to really help you bring your multiplayer games to life, things like Matchmaker, Lobby, Relay, and more, so definitely go ahead and read about those. I've also covered Lobby and Relay in two other dedicated videos. And of course, like I mentioned, the reason why I researched this game was to prepare for my upcoming free multiplayer course. And in preparation for that, make sure you go watch my full free single player course. Alright, hope that's useful, check out these videos to learn some more. Thanks to these awesome Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.